Hello and welcome to Grace Life Duras. We are a gospel-centered church family focused on reaching the unreached and making disciples. We pray that this teaching will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and discover more of the reality of Christianity. Hello and welcome back to Grace Life Duras. I'm Alicia and I'm excited to be sharing the word with you today as we discover more about the reality of our Christian faith. If you are a believer, I want to encourage you to grab a notebook and a pen. Get ready. We're going to just dig right into it. If you And your Bible. Grab your Bible. If, however, you are a seeker and you're looking for truth, I want to really, really welcome you to this recording. Know that you are not listening to this by accident, that the Lord is drawing you to Himself. And as you listen to this, May it bring more clarity, more understanding, and also may it bring you to the place where you will receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Um, As we dig into the Colossians series, and we aim to basically show you more clearly who Jesus is. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are Lord and that you are with us. I want to thank you that in this time, as we go through this word, that we will... We will draw everything possible from it, that we will not look past the simplicity of it, because in the simplicity of it, there is great power. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you guide these words like powerful seeds into the heart of our innermost being, and that we will protect it so it can produce a harvest in this life for eternity. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. So, today we are going to continue with Colossians, and if you have missed out on the series, I want to encourage you to go back. We're going through it super slow, and I realized actually that we are on part 8, and we are still in Colossians 1, and we are only at verse 11. So, I am going to kind of now start looking at verses and just choose something in the verse more that my heart is leaning towards that i believe the lord is leading us to sharing instead of trying to look at every part of the verse Um, because otherwise we're never going to finish this but with that i will say that there's nothing wrong with taking things slow when we get into the word whether you are a seeker or you have already decided that Jesus is your Lord, you will know that the longer we look at something, the more and the more clear we can see it, the more powerful and effective it will be in our lives. And it produces faith when we can see things the way that God intended it to be as it was written down. Um, so we are going to, I'm going to recap you very, very quickly just on where we are in context. We are in the middle of Paul's prayer for the Colossian church. The Colossians are being tempted to either see Jesus as just another deity, just another religion, just another God. So they don't need to worship him as Lord Almighty. Or on the other side, they've got that in a way that he's not enough. Like you need all the other things as well. But then on the other side, they are also being tempted with the reality that Um, the Jews are coming and saying, okay, your faith is only perfect if you fulfill the law. And so they're being tempted, and so are we in our world. We're constantly, actually, even without you knowing it, people are either making Jesus just another God, just another religion, just another path to follow, and there's many paths, or we are being tempted with the reality of putting our focus and our faith on what we're doing to be right with God. And neither of those are Christianity, not at all. And so the Colossians have been doing well, standing in their faith. And we have looked from part one to part seven, we've been looking at what are the things that make them stay strong. And through the prayer, we're looking at what is Paul saying to keep them standing strong? What will help them to keep on standing strong? And through all of this, our main goal has been to get to our destination, our final destination, which is our pin drop, which is how do you see Jesus or who is Jesus? More accurately, who is Jesus? Because if we see Jesus clearly for who he is, not who we want him to be, not what religion tells us he is, not what the media tells us about him, but who he really is, it will increase our faith and we will start to really live as he lived on the earth and even today through us. So I'm going to read quickly the prayer for us 
So Paul is saying from verse 9 in chapter 1, Colossians, the book of Colossians, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Whoa, that's a mouthful. Now, if we know anything about Paul, we know that he loves to put a lot into one sentence, let alone one prayer. So we've been breaking down the prayer and today I'm going to kind of close off the prayer section by focusing only really on the first part of the verse 11, which is to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Okay, I want you now, as we start, to take a moment and imagine or use your imagination. Think about what are the images that comes to mind when you think of the word power, strength, and might. What are some of the images that come to mind? Power, strength, or might. Maybe you're thinking of one of those hubs where they have the electricity, where the electricity comes from that hub to the houses. That's power. Maybe you're thinking of a big African lion. Maybe you're thinking of someone lifting weights, heavy, heavy weights, or Superman, or a picture of this the massive ocean crashing against um, a building or crashing against a lighthouse. These are forms of power for sure. And so these are some of the images that came to mind when I asked on Sunday. These are some of the images that even came to mind in my own heart. But I want to today challenge our image and idea of power and strength to lead us to really see Jesus for who he is. Because why is it that when I say, think of an image for power, strength, and might, mostly people don't think of Jesus. Mostly people do not think of Jesus' crucifixion and death and of the resurrection three days later. Why is it? Well, on Sunday, I showed the images that many times we put up on church slides that have a beautiful white cross with flowers around it, or a holy Jesus on a cloud, completely clean, completely untouched by the world. And I really believe the reason why we don't see power, strength, and might the way that the early church did, seeing it as the person of Jesus and God Almighty, is because one, our culture has made Jesus a thumbs up Jesus. Have you seen those little pop head Jesuses, which the head moves around with his thumbs in the air? The culture has made Jesus irrelevant. And if it's not the culture, the church has made Jesus beautiful instead of full of power and instead of being a God of, God of strength. And so I want you to really lean into Holy Spirit and I'm trusting Holy Spirit is going to bring this into perfect balance because of course we can take it out of balance, but I'm going to teach it in truth and truth should bring perfect balance. Okay. If Paul is praying for us to be strengthened with all power, according to God's might, then that means we are going to need some strength which means that there will be things we will face in our lives that demand a power greater than that which can be found in us as human beings. As humans, we definitely can do a lot with natural power. But how much more can we do when we see Jesus for who he truly is and that as new creations, that is a Christian, as a new creation, we are able to draw from the supernatural power that strengthens us according to his glorious might. But to do this, we have to challenge our view of how we see Jesus when it comes to power, strength, and might. So in Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3, I want to show you, now I use this verse quite a lot, but I want to show you just a small part of it. When we look, when the writer of Hebrews was meditating on who Jesus is, 
he didn't have a little white cross with flowers around it in mind. That's not what he had in mind. Look at how he sees Jesus. He says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days have spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Woe. The writer is saying that God made all things through Jesus. Watch verse 3. And he, this is Jesus, is the radiance of his God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Now watch this. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. This shows us that Jesus, Jesus, through him, all things were made. Listen, all things, not just the earth, the entire creation was made through him. And he upholds it with, a, with the word of his power. The question then, my dear friend, is how powerful is he? How powerful is he? When Luke writes about Jesus in the book of Acts, in Acts 10, 38, Luke writes about him as a, as a eyewitness testimony or, um, to people. And he's giving us just a record of history and what happened in the early church. Look here what he says when he records someone preaching about Jesus. As an account of them preaching, he writes this. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You see, there's lots of good we can do. There are lots of good things we can do. And I hope last week I touched on it in the recording that the world, sometimes the good the world does is even better than what we see Christians do. But the reality is those good works never testify about God. Those good works are all rooted in a form of self-centeredness. When, when the writers of Jesus, about Jesus, when the writers of the Gospels, when the writers of the letters were writing about Jesus of Nazareth, they said that his power and his work was all testifying about God. The good works he did was leaning into the strength, the power, and the might which is given from God, a supernatural strength and power. Look what Mark says in Mark 6 verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, began to teach in the synagogue. Listen to what the people were saying. And many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Interesting that these people who have been listening to Pharisees and scribes who were well taught, well-learned learned men, they never said this about them. But when they come in contact with Jesus, they are astonished to the degree that they are saying, we don't understand where this comes from. What are they saying? This cannot be human only. There is something divine and we know Jesus is God, so he is divine. Okay, look at Luke 19 verse 37 when he writes about Jesus. He says, as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Whoa, they did not praise Jesus alone. They looked at Jesus and they praised God. Whoa, isn't that a pure, beautiful reflection? As it said in Hebrews 1, it says he is the perfect radiance, the perfect expression. When they saw Jesus, they praised God. When we see Jesus, we praise God for what he has done. But they were praising because they saw in him something that's not natural or human. 
Okay, this is how the disciples knew him, and this is how they declared him as someone who has power. Paul starts his prayer with a need for the knowledge of God's will, remember? Because when we know what we have in God's will, which is we have the new creation, now we are able to easily understand that that same power that lived in Jesus now lives in us as born again believers. Look at 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 where it says that the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you become a new creation. His spirit fills you. You were dead, now you're alive. You were blind, now you see. You were a sinner, now you're saved. It's a massive, incredible change and complete transformation. Okay, You might not see it on the outside, but it happened on the inside you are now a new creation joined with him and so the works that he did you can also do very important then that if we don't see jesus for who he really is full of divine strength and power we will never stand up and believe that we can do what he did okay remember that paul is closing the thought on wisdom and accurate knowledge. So it's important to know that the result of knowing God and his will will produce strength, which is the dunamis strength to work miracle, to work miracles. So when we look at um, Colossians 1, when we look at verse 11 and we see that verse, he is saying that his prayer is that we would be dunamis, strengthened, with all dunamis power. So he's saying, you be dunamis with your dunamis, according to his glorious might, which is authority. That is incredible. He's, be, he's praying that we would have miracle working power, with all miracle working power, according to God's glorious authority. Whoa, that is incredible. Okay, yes. The accurate knowledge of the will of God will make me do what Jesus did. And he flowed with power and went around doing good to all who were oppressed so that men would give glory to God. In that knowledge of God, there is a revelation of the devil's work with the knowledge and power that it must be resisted so we can take up dominion. Okay? Paul did the same. He was relying on the power and strength of God in him to do what only God could do. And look at Paul's life. I mean, look at Acts 19, verse 10 to 12. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. That, my dear friend, is power. This power for miraculousness is not a strength that can come from man, but only from the one whose nature is to heal, from God living in man. So, as we bring this to a close, I want to draw your attention to a few short and small um, encounters of Jesus with man or Jesus with nature that will hopefully, if, you if it's challenged you so far, that it will continue to challenge you that who God is in you and through you is greater maybe than what you've experienced so far. If you can really see him for who he truly is. So I want you to open up your Bible and you're going to look at Mark 2 verse 1 to 12. You can pause this recording and go and read it. And I'm going to just tell you what is happening in the account. Remember, this is not a story. You know, I tell my children children's stories. We read books that are stories about animals talking and, and things like that. This is not what the Bible is. This is eyewitness historical accounts of people who were writing and explaining to us what they saw. Okay, you can go and look at this for yourself. There's lots of evidence out there to prove this is not man-made stories. Okay, this is divine and second to that, it is why eyewitnesses of what actually happened okay so 
<clears throat> you're going to see that what's happening here is that um, they, Jesus is meeting in a house, lots of people in the house, no one can come in, but then there's four friends who bring their one friend who is completely paralyzed and they bring him to Jesus. They break through the roof, straw house roof, break through it and they lower Jesus in front of this crowd, in front of the middle most properly of Jesus' teaching and Jesus immediately draws from the power that is in him. He immediately knows what to do, okay? And uh, what he does, the very first thing Jesus does is he sees the faith of the friends, meaning Jesus saw differently than we do. And then he says to this man, your sins are forgiven. Now, it's one thing for me to say to my husband or me to say to my children or my husband to say to me or my children to say to me, you are forgiven. Yes, we forgive you, mommy. Okay, when I make a mistake. Jesus was not saying it like this. Jesus, in his statement, your sins are forgiven, is saying he, as God on the earth, takes up his authority to forgive the sins of man. That is a statement only God can make. The forgiveness of that man's sin between him and God. Because that man did nothing against Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? As God on the earth, he says, your sins are forgiven you. Now, the people who lived in Jesus' day, they understood that this statement was saying he is God. Why? Why do we know it? Because in context, we see that the Pharisees get extremely upset, saying, who can forgive sin but God alone? How does Jesus respond to this? He says, immediately, immediately. I love that translation. Immediately he answers them. And you know what Jesus says? Now, listen, we are trying to see Jesus in his power, strength, and might. Look at what Jesus does. Look at this simple statement. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I have been in the presence of many great people and great leaders, okay? I have never been in the presence of someone who, knowing the thoughts of those in the crowd, says to them, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. That is extreme power. And you know, he follows it up by doing what he says. He, in fact, challenges them and says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. That is incredible. Jesus completely ignores any political agendas in the room and he cuts right to the point without getting involved in a debate, without getting involved in apologetics, although apologetics are good in Christianity, he simply goes for the heart and he proves, that must have been so insulting to the Pharisees, he proves that he is God. Isn't that incredible? In fact, when the people leave, what do they say? Everyone there leaves and they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Whoa. So that's one account that if you meditate on it, it should shock you. It should challenge you a bit. How am I praying? How do I see God? How do I see myself being forgiven? How do I see God when it comes to seeing people sick? How do I respond in those situations? Because the greater one lives in me. He lives in me today. And as he is, so am I in this world, 1 John 4. So now I'm going to take you into another account. In Mark 4, Verse 35 to 41, another account where Jesus um, and the disciples are together. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, we're going over to the other side. So he leaves the crowd. They get into the boat all together and Jesus falls asleep. And as they go across this, this um, sea, on the other side, there's someone waiting for, to receive Jesus. Okay? And uh, long story short, in the middle of all of this, a storm comes up. A storm so fierce that fishermen are scared. Now, if I'm on a boat and there's a storm, I will be scared. Even if there's just slightly too big waves, I would be scared. 
But you are talking about fishermen who came from that area, who knew the sea there, who knew the storms. And in fact, in some of the accounts, it reads that they were a bit anxious about going over the sea. Why? They had picked up signals that this is not going to be a good trip because they know the weather. They know how it works. In any case, they have a massive storm and they are scared that they are going to lose their life to the degree that they are freaking out, basically. Okay. What is Jesus doing? He is sleeping. Stop there. I have been tired and I have a husband who falls asleep in basically 0.2 seconds, especially the kind of work he does. He is tired and he can sleep through a lot, but I doubt that he would be able to sleep through a storm where you are on a little fishing boat. You are not on one of these um, cruise, cruise liners that we have today. Okay. He is sleeping. This proves a very important point that God is always has plans and doesn't matter what happens in between. He has set his mind on what is next. He set his mind knowing where God is leading him. And he does need to be concerned about what's happening in between. And he was sleeping. And yet the disciples go to wake him up. And they say to him, do you not care that we are perishing? And what does he do? Immediately because his children have cried to him, his disciples, he gets up and he rebukes the wind. He says to it, hush, be still. And the wind died down. I love that. It died down and it became perfectly calm. Whoa. Whoa, that is power. He says to that which he created, be still. And immediately it com the command is completely obeyed. Why? Because nature recognized that he, they, it is in the presence of the one who has created them. By his command, it calms down. Now that is incredible. Meditate on that. See that in your heart. I do. I, I should do it more. <laughs> but now I want to bring your attention to what happens after that. He says to the disciples, why are you afraid? What were they? Afraid. Afraid of the nature. Afraid of drowning. Afraid of the circumstances. With good reason. It was scary. And then he says, do you still have no faith? And <laughs> Do you still not believe who I am? And then the result of that correction is something we miss. They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oh, when last, my friend, have you been in the presence of Jesus? When last have you encountered God? When last have you sat in his presence until your heart becomes very much afraid with a, a reverence and an awe of who God is, an understanding of how can God Almighty, choose me to the degree that your heart says, Who are you, God? Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Jesus? That is incredible. I don't have time for the last um, scripture that I wanted to point you to, but this should give you enough. And my encouragement really is that this word should not be a nice, comfortable word that you make a note about and forget about. This word should, as it has me, challenge every part of your everyday living to say, do I see Jesus for who he truly is? And if I do see him for who he truly is, then it demands that my life has strength. It demands that my life has power and authority, which is not human, which comes from God's spirit inside of me, quickening my mortal body, quickening my mind. It comes from the Lord's spirit leading me to his purposes and his plans in the earth. Then it changes how I'm a mom. It changes how I'm a pastor and leader. It changes my vision I have for the future. It changes how we minister. It changes how we come in contact with our world that's broken and lost. It changes how we make our decisions about Jesus as Lord. And it makes us go as the disciples did. Who are you, Lord? Whoa. What is this man? more than a man, my dear friend, way more than a man and a good teacher and a prophet. Those who were alive while Jesus was alive and those who followed him closely 
those who became eyewitnesses of what he did. Not one of them walked away from those encounters going, a great man and a good prophet. Why? Because he didn't leave that option open to them. Have a great day. Enjoy. Let this challenge you. Go and look for it uh, even more in the Word for yourself. You can find more of our free teachings on our website, www.gracelife.co. And if you're ever in the Duras area, we invite you to join us for one of our gatherings. Our aim is to help you discover Jesus, find family, and experience life. To contact us or to find out where and when we meet, visit our website, www.gracelife.co.